to have a Q&A with Governor Bush. And uh, by the way, as a lot of, um, I got to start with, um, are you mad at your mom because she did say, well, I don't know if we need another Bush in the White House. What is your reaction to your mom? Well, I saw that actually, Sean, uh, on the Today Show when my brother was opening up his presidential library and my, my mom unleashed this on me on national television instead of telling me directly. That was a little difficult. But since that time, she's had a change of heart. Yeah. And that's all right by me. Well, what do you, we've had your dad and your brother as yeah. president of the United States. You made a statement the other day. You said, well, wait a minute. I am my own man. Yeah, so if, if I go beyond the consideration of the possibility of running, which is the legal terminology that many of the people here coming to CPAC are probably using to not trigger a campaign, if I get beyond that and I run for president, I have to show what's in my heart. I have to show that I care about people, about their future. It can't be about the past. It can't be about my mom and dad or my brother who I love. I love them all. It has to be about the ideas that I believe in to move our country forward so that we can have high sustained economic growth where more people have a chance at earned success because in America today, more and more people don't think that system works for them anymore. And for conservatives to win, we need to give them hope that if we create the field of dreams that people can rise up again. Let me ask you, the last time you were at CPAC, uh, this was picked up, it was in I think, Washington Post today, you said all too often we're, I think you were talking about conservatives, we are labeled and associated with being anti-everything. Way yes. too many people believe Republicans are anti-immigrant, anti-women, anti-science, anti-gay, anti-worker, and the list goes on. I want you to expand on that. Sure. So, look, the, I think the conservatives in Washington have been principled in, up, in opposing the overreach. And they've actually done a pretty good job. The president jammed down the throat, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and, and Dodd-Frank, and the stimulus. But we have fought, pr in a principled way, increased overreach. He's now using his executive power to try to carry out his agenda. But over time, we have to start being for things again. And I think what we need to be for is a strong national defense where we are committed each and every day to protect the homeland with these new asymmetric threats that exist that are real. It's not a joke. This is, this, these are threats that not just have an impact in the neighborhood in the Middle East or certainly have an impact on Israel. It, it impacts us as well. And so we need to stand for a strong national defense and the defense of the homeland. And we need to give people a sense that if we started growing our economy again, the middle would start having rising income again. And what you would do to do that is offer compelling alternatives to the failed tax policies, the failed regulation policies, a broken education system, and making sure that people know that we're on their side to rise up. Mm -hmm. So it's good to oppose the bad things, but we need to be start being for things. Yeah. And here's Sean, here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are a lot of, obviously, there are a lot of committed conservatives in this room, and this is why it's such a spectacular gathering. There are a lot of other conservatives that haven't been asked. They don't know that they're conservative. If we share our enthusiasm and love for our country and belief in our philosophy, we will be able to get Latinos and young people and other people that you need to win to get 50. This is Governor. Every, every article I have read talks about you and a divide with the conservative movement over two issues. I want to deal I with I read them. about it. You saw it once in a while? Yeah, and it, it has to do with immigration and common core. So yep. let's, let's directly deal with this. Now, yeah. you said, yeah, they broke the law. It's not a felony. It's an act of love. You also said that you support a pathway to citizenship. And I want, I, and when so, you were governor, two, two other things. When you were governor, you supported driver's licenses for illegal immigrants, and you supported in-state tuition prices for those children of illegal immigrants that weren't citizens. Wait a minute, hang on. I want, I, I want to give you an opportunity sure. to address that. Sure, so on immigration, the, I wrote a book about this, and instead of people pining about what I believe, they might want to read the book. It's called Immigration Wars. You can get it on Amazon for probably a buck ninety-nine. It's probably deeply discounted. And in that book, I talk about first and foremost the need to enforce the borders. A great country needs to enforce borders for national security purposes, public health purposes, and the rule of law. First and foremost, we have to do that. 
Secondly, we need a narrow family petitioning so that it's the same as every other country, spouse and minor children. Not this broad definition of spouse, minor children, adult siblings, and adult parents that crowds out what we need, which are economic-driven immigrants. Those that want to come here to work, to invest in their dreams in this country, to create opportunities for all of us. And that's what we need to get to. And so as a, and the plan also includes a path to legal status. I have not seen anybody, mm -hmm. and I know there's disagreement here. Some of these people are angry about this, and look, I, I kind of feel your pain. I, I was in Miami this morning, it was 70 degrees. So the simple fact is, the simple fact is, there is no plan to deport 11 million people. We should give them a path to legal status where they work, where they don't receive government benefits, where they don't break the law, where they learn English, and where they make a contribution to our society. That's the, what we need to be focused on. Okay. A lot of reaction. Let, let me do a follow-up. We had Senator Rubio, a friend of yours from Florida, yep. and I asked him the same question. We're, we always hear about spending cuts and, and tax increases. We always end up getting the tax increase. We never get the spending cut. Why, we, the Congress has tried comprehensive immigration reform, and it has failed. We now have a, a crisis going on with the Department of Homeland Security, yeah. the President's executive orders. My question is, why not secure the borders first once it's verified secured? Let's do it. First. Let's do it, man. And then talk about... I mean, so, so instead of having a political argument about, about this, the President did use authority he doesn't have. The courts are going to overrule that. I've been consistent about that. Let's control the border. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what a great nation has to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that holds back the Republicans to put a, a comprehensive plan in place to do that. But the simple fact is, this nation needs to start growing at a far faster rate than we're growing today. We have to be young and dynamic and aspirational again for all the young people in this crowd to be able to get a job with purpose and meaning. We need to begin to change the subject to high sustained economic growth. Let me, let me ask, I don't want to spend all our time on immigration, but I, I want to go through some yes or no scenarios with you. Number one, for example, do you agree with conservatives that say Congress should not pass a Homeland Security funding bill that would fund the President's illegal and unconstitutional amnesty? I think the President, I think the Congress ought to pass a bill that does not allow him to use that authority. And they should stand their ground? Not, look, look, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert on the ways of Washington. It makes no sense to me that we're not funding control of our border, which is the whole argument. Mm -hmm. I'm, missing, I'm missing something, so I'm not an borders. expert on that. The simple fact is the President has gone way beyond his constitutional powers to do this, and the Congress has every right to reinstate their responsibility for what law is about. Yes or no? 100,000 people came from Central America. We all watched over last summer. Right. Should they be sent home? I thought they should have been sent home at the border, to be honest with you, because it would have created... Here's the deal. The humanitarian thing to do would have been to consistently say from the beginning, don't risk your lives crossing as young people. Don't pay the, uh, the gangsters in Central America money from your family members in this country to come all the way across and just get into the, in, into the country and be processed. And now with our broken system, it may take three or four years to even begin to process them send a clear signal that this was a dangerous thing to do and a wrong thing to do, and it would have stopped the flow. We did that uh, as it relates to in, in Miami and in, in Florida. That was exactly what uh, Bush 41 did as it related to Haitians, and it stopped the flow of people, and, and people didn't lose their lives trying to come to this country. Let me ask you this. Um, and, and, okay. Uh, I mentioned this in, in early when I had an opportunity to speak to this great crowd here, and that is, Right now, at this point in the country, at this moment in history, we have 50 million Americans, nearly 50, in poverty. Nearly 50 million Americans on food stamps. Yep. The lowest labor participation rate since the 1970s. Yep, yep. I want you to connect it to immigration. Shouldn't Americans have the opportunity for those jobs first? You say, go to the back of the line. Yeah. No, but, but if they go to the back of the line, they still get to stay here and compete for those Sean, jobs that are available. Sean, here's the deal. You either believe that the pie is static, mm -hmm. that's the left's point of view, and many on the right don't, don't, uh, don't agree with that, but they, by their policies, they imply it. 
what we, and, and therefore we're, we're splitting it up. Someone's benefit is some, someone else's detriment. I believe that what we ought to be focused on is growing the economic pie and growing it at a rate that looks more like the 80s in America. Growing it closer to 4%, not 2%. If we stay in this anemic economic rate, then your argument becomes valid. But if we grow at 4%, there's going to be opportunities for all. It's not a zero-sum game. Yeah. That's not how Republicans and conservatives think. We don't think that it's just all about the government divvying it up for us to get our crumbs. We believe we should pursue our dreams as we see fit, and the more people doing it with the capacity to achieve earned success, the more economic growth will take place for all of us. My last question on immigration is, is going to be, as governor, do you stand by the decision, driver's licenses for Didn't happen. Didn't happen. You tried. Uh, and the other decision about in-state tuition yeah. breaks for children. I do. I do. In fact, that was the, the, um, the okay. in-state tuition was passed this year. All right. By one of the most conservative le state legislatures, I might add, and a conservative governor signed into law this last year. Let me ask you uh, the, uh, the second big issue. Not that by always, me. The, that always comes up by the gov when you read about Governor Jeb Bush is the issue of Common Core. Um, it was interesting. I didn't know until I was researching you that you were the first governor to institute vouchers in the country. It was eventually overruled by the Supreme Court of Florida. But you were the first governor to allow a voucher system. I think a lot of conservatives believe in vouchers. I want you to address the Common sure. Core issue. Well, I'll do it in the context of, of comprehensive reform, because high standards by themselves aren't meaningful. They're helpful. They're better than lower standards, but by themselves, if there's no accountability around this, if there's no consequence between mediocrity and failure or excellence, then the system won't move forward. In Florida, we took a comprehensive approach. Yes, we did have the first statewide voucher program, and we have more school choice in Florida, both public and private, than any state in the country. And we have the largest virtual school. We have the largest corporate tax scholarship program. We have 30,000 students that if their parents, that if their child has a learning disability, they can take the dollars, the state and local dollars, and send them to any private school of their choice. We have all of that, and that's improved public schools. Right. We eliminated social promotion in third grade, mm -hmm. which was a pretty difficult thing to do. We did all of this, and we raised standards. And my belief is our standards have to be high enough where a, a student going through our system is college or career ready. And that's not what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. is, now com is Common Core a federal let me takeover? No, it's and it not. shouldn't be. And here's, here's where I think conservatives and myself, all of us are deeply concerned. With this president and this Department of Education, there's a risk that they will intrude, and they have as it relates to race to the top. What we should say quite clearly in the reauthorization of the K-12 law that is just, I think it may have actually been on the floor in the House of Representatives today is to say the federal government has no role in the creation of standards, either directly or indirectly. The federal government has no role in the creation of, of curriculum and content. The federal government should have no access to student ID or student information. That the role of the federal government, if, it's, if there's any, is to provide incentives for more school choice. Take the Title I money and the IDEA money, and if states want to innovate with their own programs, give them the money to let them create their own programs. That is a better approach. Yeah. I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your, govern your record as governor. Yeah. And, and as much as you privatize state jobs, I did see you veto $2 billion in spending in eight years as governor. You cut taxes $19 billion as governor. Yeah. I'm doing my research. You ended affirmative action. I want to give you a chance so, to explain, for those that, that earlier today I was surprised, I was mentioning candidates, some people, ooh, when I mentioned your name. I want to give you a chance to talk about your record directly to the people you bet. here at CPAC. Well, first of all, for those that um, made a ooh sound, is that what it was? Well, I'm, been, marking, I'm marking them down as neutral, and I want to be your second choice if I decide to go beyond this. Mm -hmm. But here's the record, and it's, an, it's a record that may be hard for people to imagine because it's a record of accomplishment of getting things done, of taking conservative principles, running on them for starters, and having the courage to say I was for a statewide voucher program, that I believed that we should cut spending, that we needed to take on the trial bar and all the things we did. So we created a world-class business climate. 1.3 million net new jobs were created in eight years, more than any state but one. Don't tell Rick Perry, but more than Texas during those eight years. We, I left the state with a 3% unemployment rate. 
We made, we made Florida business friendly and they came and they created jobs. Our economy grew by something like 3.9% when the, the rest of the country was growing at 2.6%. At, at we have reformed our education system, as I, as I mentioned, and Florida, it wasn't just the fight that mattered. We actually have led the, led the country in rising student achievement. Kids in poverty now are the leaders in Florida. They, out, they outperform all of their peers in most, most of the categories in other places. Florida is a place where conservative principles have helped not just Republicans, but everybody. We eliminated affirmative action, Sean. I know there are people that come here and talk about the courage legitimately so of their of their efforts i eliminated affirmative action by executive order trust me there were a lot of people upset about this but through hard work we ended up having a system where there were more african-american and hispanic kids attending our university system than prior to the system that was discriminatory All right. one more thing yeah. i left the state i left the state with 9.5 billion dollars of reserves no drunken sailors were around. They called me Vito Corleone because we did veto 2,500 line items in the budget totaling $2 billion. We left my successor two, $9 billion plus dollars of cash for a rainy day. And then we had the financial meltdown. And so conservatives need to be focused on not spending everything that they have, of cutting taxes to simulate economic growth so that more revenue comes in people's pockets and the government gets their fair share as well. Do you think you can lower taxes with 18.1 trillion in debt that we have now 100 trillion in unfunded liabilities? You can lower taxes and create more economic opportunity that will generate more revenue for government than any of the most exotic tax plans that Barack Obama has. Right. Yes, I let believe me, that. I'm looking at the clock. Let me, let me ask, National security, national defense. Uh, your brother predicted in 2007, unfortunately, with pinpoint accuracy, what would happen if we left Iraq too early. We didn't keep intelligence on the ground, training forces on the ground. Now we have ISIS, people being beheaded, burned to death, a war on terror that is being waged, Coptic Christians, simultaneous beheadings. My question is, what would you do if you were the commander in chief to defeat ISIS? By the way, and, and Mitt Romney was right in the debate about Putin. And Mitt Romney was right about a lot of things that the president just left off about yep. not having a strong military. And so our position needs to be to re-engage with a strong military and a strong presence. We can't disengage in the world and expect a good result. As we pull back, voids are filled. Iraq is the best example of that. So where to from here? We need to reestablish relationships with countries that we have we have managed to mess up. I mean, we've managed to mess up almost every relationship in the world, if you think about it, including Canada, which is hard to do, but we've done it. <laughs> but Egypt, we got it wrong three times in a row in the last few years. Jordan, the king comes asking for support. I've yet to see. Perhaps it went covertly, but I haven't heard anything. Israel? Israel, for sure. Turkey, all of these countries have doubts about America. We need to be engaged in the world build a coalition to isolate and then put ISIS around a noose and take them out. And that can be done not by ourselves unilaterally. That has to be done with American leadership. How would you do it? Specifically, what would, you, what would be your first step? I like the it? idea that Senator Corker's talking about, about pushing, creating a, a safe zone for the creation of a free Syrian army, which we should have done three years ago, but begin that process. I like the idea of, of not putting conditions of boots on the ground so that we could have the intelligence capabilities and the special forces capabilities to make a difference. I like these ideas, but all of them require re-engaging with the neighborhood so that they consider it a high priority for their own interests to be able to participate in this. And the negotiations with Iran make this far more complicated. The idea that we're gonna be tripping over, finding a, a deal, negotiating downward, creating an unsafe world, and basically legit legitimizing the Ayatollah and his, and his nuclear capability is really troubling. All the reports are that this deal that is being negotiated, that negotiations are going on now, that in fact the mullahs of Iran, who have threatened repeatedly to wipe Israel off the map, will in fact be allowed to enrich uranium. They have the delivery system. Exactly right. As president, what would you say to any deal that was struck before you took office as it relates to a... Well, first, I hope the Congress acts on this and requires that this deal go back for approval in the United States Congress. I think that is the first step, so that we don't get to the point where the next president, because it'll be done by executive order, is, is, is forced to undo 
that by executive order as well. That would be the best thing to do. But we need to be clear that there should be no light between us and Israel, and we need to be clear that other discussions as it relates to Iran need to include their, their strategy of using surrogates to destabilize the region. Simply focusing on whether or not Iran has a weapon, and then now negotiating down where we're going to regulate it, is, is just bad policy. What is your reaction to a president that can't acknowledge radical Islam or the Islamic State is Islamic? Um, what is your reaction that there's to that? E you know, that this is all about economic uncertainty and if they could just get jobs. The jobs program for jihadis. Yeah, so the jihadi, by the way, that was identified in London was a college graduate and from rich. the middle and, and rich. wealthy. Yeah, this Bin Laden was rich. This total misunderstanding of what this, this Islamic uh, terrorist threat is is very dangerous because it it doesn't allow you then to have the right strategy to deal with this. We need to heighten awareness of what this threat means and be honest about it, which is why I think Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit is going to be really important. He's going to be able to tell the truth on this, and the American people, I believe, are going to reject what President Obama is trying to do in Iran. Right, I'm running out of time. I've got to wrap up in a minute. Um, I've asked every other candidate that I've had an opportunity to interview real quickly. Boxers. <laughs> That was not the question. Oh, uh, second. The top Thank five, God it wasn't. I'll leave that for NBC News. Um, <laughs> the top five agenda, if you become president, what are your top five priorities in the first 100 days? Undoing, <laughs> yeah, right. Undoing the, uh, by executive order, undoing what the president has done, not you know, using authority he doesn't have creating a regulatory reform agenda that allows for investment to take place in our country, presenting to Congress a plan to reform our tax code so that we can see inversions happen the other way, where companies invest in our country to create high-wage jobs. We need to get back to high sustained economic growth and then send the signal to the rest of the world that we're going to be their partner for peace and security. All right, I'm going to do our lightning round, but before I do that, uh, a lot has been written about Terry Schiavo. You used to yeah. have a a license plate that said choose life. Yeah. Any regrets over the Terry Schiavo fight? No, we had we were the first state to uh, have a choose life license plate that helped uh, with crisis pregnancy uh, centers around the around the country, around the state. And um, I'm pro life. Mm -hmm. I also believe that the most vulnerable in our society need to be protected. Mm -hmm. And in this case, here was a woman who was vulnerable and the court uh, because of our laws, didn't allow her, we're, we're gonna, we're, she was, they were going to allow her to be starved to death. So we passed a law, Terry's law, that was a year later ruled unconstitutional. I stood, stayed within the law, but I acted on my core belief that the most vulnerable in our society should be in the front of the line. They should receive our love and protection, and that's exactly what I did. Where you stand today. Okay. There was an indication in an article today, gay marriage, are you changing your position at all? No, I believe in traditional marriage. Okay. There, there are numerous reports that you're telling people privately that you are a moderate, but then no. public. How do you? De I describe myself as a Reagan constitutional conservative. How would you describe yourself? I would describe myself as a practicing, reform-minded conservative. That I've actually done it. Marijuana in Colorado legalization, good or bad idea? I thought it was a bad idea, but states ought to have that right to do it. I would have voted State. no if I was in Colorado. Would have, okay. I'm going to mention a few names. We've gotten some very interesting answers on this question. Uh, Hillary Clinton? Foreign fundraising. Okay. We're supposed to do a word association? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Okay. You did good. Uh, that, how'd that work compared to the very other good. ones? Okay, just check. Uh, Bill Clinton? Oh, Bubba. <laughs> All right, that's pretty funny. I do an impression. How you doing? I want to say hi to the cute chick in the back there. All right. Um, <laughs> The governor's not responsible. Let me responsible. get a little bit over here. Yeah, I know. Stay away from these radio and TV talk hosts. Um, Barack Obama. Failed president. <laughs> Failed president. You know, there's been such a big debate now about the issue of American exceptionalism. Yeah. In your view, do you, A, believe America's exceptional? And why do you love this country enough that you are going to go through the difficulty and the trials and tribulations of running for office? And that's our last question. Well, I do believe in American exceptionalism. I got to be the chairman of the National Constitution Center for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's the center that honors our Constitution. It's a museum in Philadelphia. I urge everybody to go. And I fell in love with the Constitution again, being, being there. Uh, 
in its presence. And this president has trampled over the Constitution. And put aside whether you like his beliefs or not, I imagine no one in this room does, the fact that he is disrespecting our history and the extraordinary nature of our, of our country by doing what he's done is deeply disturbing to me. And so I think restoring a love of our country and its heritage and its tradition and expanding that love in a way that uh, draw, gives people confidence that they can rise up, that they can live the American dream, has to be one of the prime responsibilities of the next president of the United States. I Ladies and gentlemen, CPAC, Governor.